Okay, great. It is 8.59, um, so I believe that by the time I'm finished doing our intro slide, it should be 9 o'clock on the dot. This is Ariana Longley, Vice President of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Before I get started, I just want to make sure that you all can hear me. I think, Edwin, you're off um, mute. Can you hear me okay? I can. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Okay, so today uh, we will be presenting a webinar on handoff communications. It's aligned with our actionable patient safety solution number six. Today is June 28th, 2018, and today we'll have expert presenters, Dr. Stephen Barker and Edwin Lofton. So real briefly, um, just wanna let you know for housekeeping, everyone has been muted on entry to ensure that it is nice and clear so that everyone can hear our presenters. We will open up um, and unmute everyone for the questions and answers at the end. Um, please feel free to chat your questions along the way and we can always um, bring those up at the end. There is a chat box. Um, the presentation today is 60 minutes. The first 10 minutes, I'll be introducing the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and our actionable patient safety solutions, which we're calling our app. And then we'll have 40 minutes presentation on um, handoff communications by Dr. Stephen Barker and Edwin Lofton, and then we'll follow with 10 minutes Q&A. So today we're talking about patient safety movement. Our mission is zero preventable deaths by 2020. And so we say zero X2020 or zero by 2020. And we believe that zero is the only acceptable goal because one preventable patient death in the hospital is one too many. The Patient Safety Movement Foundation is fostering new efforts and building on existing patient safety programs through commitments to zero. We're trying not to reinvent the wheel. We're trying to use the momentum and make as many um, commitments as possible. So these are the groups that can make, who can take action. There are five groups. So hospitals and healthcare organizations, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation encourage, encourages to make an online public commitment to improving safety. This can be an initiative that they're already working on, but can publicly share through our network of over 4,598 hospitals across four, uh, 44 countries. And so uh, those organizations publicly share how they're saving lives and how many lives they're saving if they have the methodology to, to show. We have committed partners, and these are nonprofits, professional societies, associations, advocacy groups, and we call them our committed partners and they sign a customized commitment to action letter. All of these are publicly available. You can find them on our website, and um, it just encourages uh, connections between all the stakeholders in healthcare uh, that are working on patient safety. We work together and work on uh, partnerships to align. The third group that we work with are healthcare technology companies. This is a really important group for us because we believe that in order to improve patient safety, we must have open and uh, freely moving data. And so we encourage healthcare technology companies, so med tech companies, lab companies, anyone who's creating patient data or can transmit patient data to sign a letter that we call our open data pledge. And it encourages interoperability by removing barriers. Um, basically, companies uh, agree to not block data or uh, knowingly interfere or charge for that data connection. We have 83 companies who've signed that pledge to date. The fourth group that we work with are patients and family advocates. We believe strongly that sharing stories is a really great way to get momentum and to encourage change within health systems. We also create resources. We have a mobile app called Patient Eater, for example, and we also utilize resources that have been developed by a lot of these advocacy groups, like checklists for families that are going into the hospital. So these are our actionable patient safety solutions. We call them apps. They're not mobile apps quite yet, um, but they are uh, APSSs. And these have been developed over the last six years since the foundation was launched in 2012. And every year at our mid-year planning meeting, uh, we vote on new challenges to appear on this list. And everyone who's at that meeting gets a ballot and we, we vote on what the leading causes of preventable deaths are. And so you can see these 16 on uh, the left. And then each one of those also uh, may have a sub app or, or two or three. Um, so for example, the uh, apps on healthcare associated infections has several sub apps on hand hygiene, 
CAUTI, CLABC, SSI, VAP, and these are really good examples of uh, self-assessment tools that hospitals can use to make sure that they really are doing everything that they can to improve safety. Today, we're talking about app number six, which is handoff communications. And so our presenters today will be specifically talking about uh, the role of handoff communications uh, as it relates to patient safety and uh, how we've seen improvements in that area. So just to remind you uh, how the patient safety movement is measuring our impact. Since we launched in 2012 and, and first started getting measurable, measurable results in 2013, we've seen a huge increase in the number of hospitals that are participating by making these public commitments to improve safety. And so in our first year, we had 63 hospitals, the second year, 100. And then most recently, last year, we announced 4,598 hospitals are participating in our work across 44 countries. And so it's really a good opportunity for whether, you know, here locally where we're based in Irvine, California, or Texas, or Brazil, um, hospitals are really rallying together and sharing how they're improving safety and learning from one another. Those hospitals, as I mentioned, also have the, uh, the possibility if they are measuring their successes uh, through standardized met methodology, they share how many lives they're saving. So the first year, 63 lives were saved. In 2015, that jumped up to 6,571. And last year, earlier this year in February, we announced 81,533 lives were saved during 2017. And we really believe that we have to focus in on every single life. So we, we love being able to share these very specific numbers um, that hospitals are reporting back to us. So with that, that was a little bit of background about the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. I'll now introduce our expert speakers. First, we'll have Dr. Barker, who will spend the first 20 minutes on some basics about patient safety, about uh, handoff communications, and then he'll pass it off to Dr. Uh, excuse me, to Edwin Lofton. So let me just do a brief introduction for each person. So Dr. Uh, Barker received his Bachelor of Science in Physics from Harvey Mudd College in 1967, his PhD in Aeronautical Engineering from the California Institute of Technology in 1972, and his MD from the University of Miami in 1981. He's reached the rank of tenured professor in both engineering from UCLA and anesthesiology from UCI, uh, UCI and University of Arizona. He chaired the Department of Anesthesiology at UC Irvine from 1990 to 1995, and then at the University of Arizona from 1995 to 2013. He's published over 200 scholarly works. He's now Professor Emeritus of Anesthesiology and Aerospace Engineering at the University of Arizona. Dr. Barker has been involved with Massimo Corporation, a world leader in medical technology since its beginnings uh, in 1990, and he now serves as Massimo's Chief Science Officer and member of the Board of Directors. Dr. Barker is also actively involved with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and serves on its board of directors. In 2015, Dr. Barker received the Lifetime Achievement Award from IMPOV, that's the Innovations and Applications of Monitoring for Fusion, Oxygenation, and Ventilation, for championing the development of vitally important monitoring technologies and assisting associated testing. In 2016, he received the J.S. Gravenstein Award from the Society for Technology and Anesthesia for his visionary understanding of the role of technology in anesthesia care and lifetime commitment to patient safety. Also in 2016, he received the Distinguished Alumni Award from Harvey Med College. So our second speaker is Edwin Lofton. He's the Senior Vice President of Integrated and Acute Care Services and Chief Nursing Officer of Parish Medical Center. He's a progressive senior healthcare executive who cultivates a culture of healing and person and family-centered care. Uh, Edwin led the med medical center's efforts to become the first in the nation to earn the Joint Commission's Integrated Care Certification. Under his leadership, Parish Healthcare has maintained an impeccable quality and patient safety record, including our five-star uh, ranking through the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, Safe Care Group's Top 100, LeapFrog Group's Highest Hospital Safety Score. Parish Healthcare is also a member of the world-renowned Mayo Clinic uh, Care Network, and Lofton's community service includes serving the Joint Commission Clinical Advisory Team for Vizient, Vizient Southeast, and Truven Advisory Committee. Board member of the Safe Care Group and um, member of the advisory boards for UCS and ESSC Colleges of Nursing, 
board chair of the Space Coast Chapter of the American Red Cross, board member of the Brevard County Big Brothers and Big Sisters, and serving as the United Way of Brevard employee campaign manager. Lofton earned his Master of Business Administration degree from East Carolina University and his Bachelor of Science degree in nursing from Atlantic Christian College in Wilson, North Carolina. He's a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives and a member of the American Organization of Nurse Executives. So we are so pleased to have these two amazing speakers with us today. So I will pass it on now to Dr. Steve Barker to take us away. Thanks, Ariana. Steve Barker here. I hope you can all hear me okay. Uh, you probably know more about me than you ever wanted to know, but uh, one thing I'll just uh, stress is that I was originally an aeronautical engineer and then went into anesthesiology. So that gives you a little bit of a hint of uh, what my approach is going to be. I like to combine the two. I'm going to give you a little background on handoffs and um, then talk about what our committee has done so far, our work group, and then I'd like to get, very much like to get your input. With that in mind, I'm actually going to try to stay below the 20 minutes. So a handoff, is it a, is it a coordinated, carefully timed, precision transfer of care from one provider or healthcare team to another, or is it another kind of handoff? And it can be, uh, I, I like to use graphics, by the way, I should warn you. Um, it can be either one, and let's talk about what, uh, what distinguishes one uh, from the other. We'll start with some definitions. They're simple and they're obvious, so I'll go through them quickly, but I want to make sure we're all starting at the, at the same point. A patient handoff between caregivers is a transfer and acceptance of care responsibility achieved through effective communication of patient-specific information to ensure continuity and safety of care. And I will stress over and over again that the receiver is a, an active participant. He's not just a passive. Uh, the handoff process involves senders, the caregivers who are transmitting the patient information and transitioning care to the next caregiver, who are, of course, the receivers. Those caregivers accept patient information. They must understand it and accept the care responsibility. Patient risk is introduced when clinicians fail to properly communicate the patient's condition, either communicate or understand, uh, the therapies or actions taken or planned or any other special considerations about the patient. The Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality, AHRQ, has reported that half, at least half, of hospital staff believes that patient information is lost during transfers across hospital units and during shift changes. Furthermore, even more uh, alarming is that breakdown in communication, that is handoffs, was the leading root cause of sentinel events, sentinel events reported to the Joint Commission between 1995 and 2006. Wow, that's pretty scary, isn't it? What are the required ingredients of a proper handoff? Well, here are a few, and this is, this is my list just for starters. Why is the patient in the hospital? What's the chief complaint? What is the problem list? What are all of the medical problems, uh, even if not relevant to this hospital admission, but they might become in part important during the hospitalization? And there have been a lot of handoff errors in incomplete problem lists. Uh, the history and physical, obviously not a detailed description, but pertinent findings. Lab tests and other results, again, the ones that are pertinent to the patient care. All medications and treatments, both current and planned. What has been the hospital course to the point at which the handoff is occurring? What progress has the patient made? What complications have occurred? What is the discharge plan? How are we going to get this patient home? That's kind of the final handoff uh, that we should talk about. What is the plan for getting the patient well? And finally, the sender should say to the receiver, here are my recommendations. Here is what I think and what I suggest. And of course, the receiver not only receives that, but understands it and, and can and should question it. What else do we need on this list? And here, here comes my orientation, warning, warning. 
it's a list, and, and we check this list frequently, right? Uh, we check it, and it's a list. Hey, it's a checklist, of course, which uh, comes to us uh, via aviation, uh, among other sources. We need a checklist for three reasons. We're human and we forget stuff, and I stress this over and over again when I talk about checklists. They are not recipes. They are tools to prevent us from forgetting stuff, which we often do. Why do we forget stuff? Two reasons. One, we live in a world of increasing complexity. That applies to flying airplanes and handing off patients in patient care. And three, the, the other extra ingredient that often results in these disasters is what I call distractors, little events that change your train of thought. Maybe uh, it may just be the noisy environment uh, in the hospital ward where you're trying to accomplish uh, the handoff. Maybe there are some distracting events going on. Um, and these are the things that kind of make you skip stuff, either in transmitting or receiving the handoff information and lead to disaster. Aviation has learned this uh, in, in spades. Here's a checklist for starting up a 747. This doesn't get you in the air. It just gets you to the point where you release the brakes and start your taxi. Obviously, nobody could remember all of this every, every day, and nobody would even try. It's the same in medicine. And I'm not the first who has made this argument, obviously. My hat's off to Dr. Atul Gawande, an endocrine surgeon at Brigham and Women's. First, he published this book, The Checklist Manifesto, and if you haven't read it, I recommend it. It's available on Kindle, too. Uh, then he actually did a follow-up study where he, he has shown that the use of his surgical checklist during surgery has actually caused reductions in surgical morbidity and mortality. That's quite impressive, and my hat is really off to, to a tool. I've had the opportunity to talk with him for actually getting surgeons to use this checklist approach. Uh, wow, that's quite an accomplishment. So what can we do? Again, going back to aviation for an example, if you don't use a checklist, and this is my one uh, cartoon far side for this talk, the fuel light's on, Frank, we're all going to die. Oh, wait, my mistake, that's the intercom light. You need to be sure of what you are hearing, what you are saying, and that you understand it. Here's an example from aviation. This is the only one I'll use today, but it's dramatic. You've all flown in these high-performance airplanes. I hope you can see my pointer here. Uh, when these airplanes take off, the, the wing here that you see is designed to support the weight of the airplane at about 450 miles per hour. But the plane has to take off at about 120 miles an hour, and that wing that's designed to support the plane at 450 has to generate a lot of extra lift with a speed of only 120. How does it do that? By putting down these flaps on the back of the wing, and you can also see the leading edge slats, the leading edge of the wing actually droops. Those two changes have to be made for takeoff, before takeoff, otherwise the plane would need so much airspeed to lift off that it would need miles and miles of runway, which you don't have. It's part of the pre-takeoff checklist. In this flight in 1908, not that long ago, they missed this. Why did they miss it? We'll never know because most of them died. Unfortunately, 154 deaths, only 18 survivors. I can give you a list of uh, a dozen accidents like this and a similar list in medicine where obvious things were forgotten because somebody wasn't using a checklist. And the same is true with handoffs, handoff communications. And remember, there is both a sender and a receiver in each handoff, and both are active participants, not passive. Here is uh, my preliminary list of 18 different handoffs that take place in the hospital. I'm not going to read all these to you, but you can see that there are four categories of senders, the emergency department, the hospital ward unit, the operating room, and the paramedics, the ambulance. And they send their patients to all of these other receiving uh, entities. And for each of these uh, sender-receiver combinations, you need a handoff checklist. That's 18 checklists. And what else? Uh, there are more, and in fact, uh, we've come up with some more since that original list. I'll mention a couple. 
We started in 2016 in our work group uh, with this, uh, with these six, and we actually wrote out, developed the checklist for these six handoffs. Here's a list of the people who uh, led those efforts. And then in uh, 2017, we added four more. So we've got a total of 10 of these checklists reasonably well developed now. I will show you just three examples. And again, I'm not going to read them uh, for lack of time, but you can, uh, you can study these at your leisure. You will have access to this slideshow. Here's the handoff checklist for emergency room to the operating room. This is one that I wrote. And you can see it kind of has a logical order, starting with the chief, chief complaint, why is the patient coming to the operating room, what is the plan, the special anesthesia needs, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is one of the handoffs that has to take place in a relative hurry. And some of the, some of the handoffs, some of the 18, are under intense time pressure and others are not. Um, this is one that can be under a time pressure. So you, you might need to shorten it in various ways, and I'd like your advice on that too. Here's another handoff. This one is uh, shift change, and it uses what's called the SBAR acronym, which is situation, background, now we're getting some sort of fire alarm, which is another type of handoff. <laughs> okay, welcome to handoffs. Um, Situation, background, assessment, and recommendation, and you see how this has been applied to shift change. Shift change in the hospital is a more leisurely handoff. There's usually not an intense time pressure, but it's one that can take place at various locations. It may be at a nurse's station or it may be at the patient's bedside, and so there's a high incidence of what I call distractors, other things going on at the time of the handoff. And here's a third example, which is another one that's under intense time pressure, and that's basically from the ambulance, the paramedics, to the emergency department, uh, and we kept that intentionally short and sweet, uh, starting with ABCDs, airway, breathing, circulation, and drugs. Um, is the patient awake? Was there a loss of consciousness, et cetera? You can read this. So those are three examples. We have 10 of them. There are at least 18 to be done. In fact, the number is more like 20. Um, can we simplify this list? Are there any of these that can be combined? Are there any that, frankly, can be eliminated that we could do without? That's what I'd like to discuss uh, with you all and uh, with everybody involved in this, what are the next steps? And I'll, I'll say a few words of that in a couple of minutes about next steps. What do these checklists actually look like? Where are they physically? Are they five by seven laminated plastic cards in the pocket of your white coat? Or are they something else? And I'll show you a, an, idea, an idea on that. Some of the checklists are time limited. Uh, some are not, as I already pointed out. Here's an example of, uh, you know, another possibility for where they are physically located. Rather than a laminated plastic card, maybe it's on your iPad or your iPhone. Uh, this is just a very crude example that I ginned up on my uh, iPad. Um, I, I want to stress that uh, not only, as I said, there's a sender and a receiver, these checklists are not forms to be filled out, and I don't want people to have that. Uh, impression that we're creating more paperwork. It's quite the opposite. Uh, but if we did it on iPads, they might be able to enter data. They should be able to enter data from the patient's electronic medical record. And the data on uh, the entries by the sender would instantly appear on the receiver's tablet or iPhone. And uh, because it's digital and not in in the hard print, the checklist can be branched, which means the next item on the checklist might depend on the answers to the previous item. So there's a logic to it, not just a one-dimensional list. Uh, it can be updated either by the sender or the receiver, and the updates would appear on both, and that's something very desirable. As I said several times already, the receiver is not a passive participant in this and it would, uh, as I said, connect with the electronic medical record, get updates on labs and everything else. How about voice recognition? Hey Siri or hey Alexa, why is this patient here? 
Um, sure, why not? And I, I think that's, uh, I think that's definitely coming. Uh, in, in going to the electronic and digital versions of these checklists, we are limited only by our own imagination. And so, as, as I said, I want to, I want us all to think of these as more than just pieces of paper or plastic cards. Uh, and let's discuss that. How we do that in detail would be probably different for each checklist. We are not alone, we the patient safety movement, are not alone in tackling handoff communications. We had an excellent meeting of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation last fall, the Stolting Conference, which was devoted entirely to handoff communications, uh, which are, were recognized to be both a risk and an opportunity. And here is the uh, APSF's flowchart uh, on, on checklists involved. Now, these are just the perioperative ones, perioperative handoffs. Uh, so these, these don't involve even most of the ones that were on my original list. And as you can see, a very important uh, area that they added that I had not put in my original list was the perioperative holding room, the room that the patients are waiting in before they go to the operating room. Every one of these white arrows between all these boxes is another handoff. So APSF is working on that and plan to continue that this year. The Joint Commission is also actively involved uh, in adequate handoff communications, not only in their newsletter, uh, but I want to point out one thing from this newsletter that I think was uh, a very good point. Common problem in handoffs. Expectations can be out of balance between the sender of the information and the receiver. That, I have to agree, is a key problem. Expectations out of balance lead to communications out of balance. And as I said, this is probably the sixth time I've said this, the receiver cannot just be a passive participant. The receiver must acknowledge not only hearing, but also understanding the communications and should question if the receiver wants more detail or doesn't understand something, two-way communication. Here is the um, ten tips, uh, sorry, eight tips from the uh, Joint Commission for high-quality handoffs. I don't uh, think all of these are universally applicable, but it's uh, you know it's worth reading these suggestions, um, and uh, I'm glad the Joint Commission is involved with this. Um, so my conclusions are, before I hand this off to the next provider, are one, handoff communications are not rocket science, but in stressful environments like we work in every day, it is very easy to forget stuff. Same as those disasters that I talk about in aviation. We forget the obvious stuff because of the presence of distractors. Patient handoffs and flying airplanes have quite a bit in common. Both of these events need to use checklists, um, and I think we agree on that. There are about 20 different inpatient handoff types. As I said, we have developed preliminary versions of 10 of these. There is a checklist list for each. Uh, some may be better off on paper or cards. Some may be better off in digital format. Let's talk about that. Some institutional variability is definitely appropriate. Different hospitals will have different patient populations, different procedures, different protocols. So I'm not saying that it's a one size fits all. There will be at least minor variations. And we're now at the stage in our work group of pilot programs actually implementing this. That is, let's try these handoff procedures and checklists in some real clinical settings and see how it works and go back to the drawing board from that and refine the process. And that's where I am going to do the handoff to my colleague and friend Edwin Lofton, who's going to tell us about their uh, in initial work at Parrish Medical Center, which is an outstanding medical center. And I, I want to end with my picture of the F-22 Raptor, Raptor <laughs> my favorite airplane. And thank you very much. Uh, Edwin, I hand it off to you. Well, Dr. Barker, thank you so very much. An excellent background and, and setting the stage. And as Dr. Barker said, um, what I'll do is go through the actual implementation of one of these checklists. I've had the privilege of 
of working with Dr. Barker and the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and the subgroup on uh, handoff communications and have developed the uh, current um, handoff for emergency department to inpatient medical surgical units. Uh, so next slide, please. So first, a little bit about uh, who we are, Parish Medical Center. Uh, Parish Medical Center is located in an area called the Space Coast of Florida, Brevard County. Uh, we look out our window and we actually look at the launch pad for Kennedy Space Center. So as Dr. Barker said, um, handoff communication may not be rocket science, uh, but actually rocket science needs checklists and appropriate handover, handover and handoff communication. It's interesting when we listen to the, the countdowns um, from Kennedy Space Center and their attention to detail using the checklist of every component of safety until that launch actually occurs. Um, we are a standalone, not-for-profit community hospital. <clears throat> we are the largest employer in our part of the county at, at 1,200 care partners and, and volunteers and, and physicians. And as Ariana said in introductions, we are a member of the Mayo Clinic Care Network. Uh, we're very honored in that we were able to build a, a replacement facility in 2002 that is based on the principles of healing. So we've, we've created a physical environment um, that is focused on person and family-centered care. And as we approach patient safety and, and safe practices, um, our philosophy and, and what we believe should be everybody's is to make sure that the person and the family are part of that handover and that transition. So we spent uh, quite a bit of time over 2017 uh, looking at the existing uh, patient safety movement um, handoff checklist and began researching and applying uh, principles behind our development of the ED to med surge um, handover checklist, uh, which is what you see before you. We've used several evidence-based practices that Dr. Barker referred to in our development. One is we have the background of FR situation, background assessment and recommendations. We also looked at the research done by Atul Gawande and others. We used the eight uh, tips of recommendations from the Joint Commission. We used literature from uh, AHRQ and the National Patient Safety Foundation to come together and say what information is, is critical for zero harm um, in, in that transition of care. And again, I'm not going to, like Dr. Barker, I'm not going to read every component. Of of, you, of this for you, but as you can see on screen, we covered very, very specific components within there. A couple of things to point out is really looking at the recommendations and, and the last thing. Um, the next to last thing you see is a statement that says, my story. And this is intended as we are doing a clinical handover in the care of a person, we have to remember that is the person that we're partnering in care with. We're not here treating pneumonia. We are here in partnering in care with Sam. And so who is Sam? Is Sam a 26-year-old um, athletic football player in college and has a, has a sports injury that may be ending his career? Um, is Sam a 88-year-old great-grandfather of, of five who all he wants to do is be able to go home and have his great-grandchild sit on his lap one more time? That is a driver in not only the clinical care, but in our approach to, to safety and our, our connection with the person and the family in making sure we do that. The, the next, very next item is face-to-face. -face. The evidence is very, very strong that when three faces are together during that handover um, and, the and the use of the checklist, that's where zero harm can be achieved. And those three faces are the sender, the receiver, and the patient or the person in the bed. We have to include them in the conversation and we have to use language in that checklist and that handover that they understand so that they can, in a very transparent manner, ask us questions, understand what their plan of care is, and have input uh, into their plan of care. Uh, so this was the checklist that we created. Um, during this time frame, I also did some data analysis at Parish Medical Center of what, what could our potential impact be. So um, from 
calendar year 2017, um, I actually did a review of event reports, and we had, and, and I used a very broad uh, definition of harm or injury, and we had 48 events uh, that either were in harm or injury or could have led to, and I, and I used definitions, everything from missed medications, incorrect medications, missed information, um, if a patient fell during transition or if there was a, um, a rapid response call within 12 hours of transfer, those types of definitions. So we had 48 events. One is too many in, in our point of view. So then we went to implementation. Next slide, please. The flow chart you see here is the methodology that we have chosen to use in that handoff. And the checklist is in the background providing the guidance for information, making sure we're not losing anything. But this flow chart is that literal movement of information, of knowledge, of person, and of materials from the ED to the med surge floor. And as you see in the bottom part of that, the person is in the center of everything that we do. Uh, we have now implemented the, this checklist and an associated process with this flowchart since May 6th of this year. So we're coming up on um, two months of implementation. And uh, last week, um, I'm sorry, earlier this week, I did a data run of events during that time frame. And knock on wood, whether it's by dumb luck or what I hope is more true, by intentional use of evidence-based practices, the checklist, and person and family-centered care during that, this trial period, we have had zero harm at the bedside from transitions of care from the ED to med surge. Next slide, please. So again, that's sort of the, the summary of where we are. Now, in addition to um, at this point in time having zero harm, we've seen actually several side or additional benefits come to the organization by use of this uh, flow, flow process and handoff checklist, and that is efficiencies in operations. We've seen a 30% reduction in time from the patient being ready to move out of the ED, having a clean bed, until the patient actually gets into that bed. Um, that 30% reduction um, opens up beds on the inpatient side, decreases lags and holes in the ED, and again, even just within itself at that point in time, decreases opportunities for errors during holds or misinformation within there. So our early analysis is the handoff, the, the evidence-based handoff checklist does allow us to move to zero harm by 2020. Um, so that, that's sort of the, where we are in our implementation. Uh, Dr. Barker, I appreciate any input or challenge to the process and look forward to questions and conversation. Great. Thank you so much, Edwin. Um, it was great to have both you uh, and Dr. Barker provide us with some background and then actual implementation of um, an example of one of the checklists and the actionable patient safety solutions. Um, so we'll move on. Or Dr. Barker, did you have any comments before we move on? I, to I just want to thank Edwin for an excellent presentation, and this is exactly the kind of pilot implementation uh, program that we, we would like to see now. And as I said, we will learn from each one of these and, and make changes and refinements and make it better. Great. And, 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 and you're very welcome. And again, this is what I think what every organization has the opportunity to do and, and what our plans at Paris Medical Center are is probably after another two months of truly hardwiring this process, we've already begun looking at how do we edit, modify this, and adopt the other checklist for the additional transitions of care. When we can see this kind of, of improvement in zero harm for one transition, like you said, Dr. Barker, there's at least 20, if not more, other types. It's our obligation to carry those forward as well. Right. Great. All right, well, we are going to unmute um, so that you have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, I do see that there is one question that we've noticed on the chat, so we can address that one first before we unmute everyone. 
Uh, this question comes from Linda Chancy, and she asks, how does the sending ED nurse and receiving med surge nurse do face-to-face? -face? We've tried processes where the nurses go to the other nurses unit to hand off where the patient uh, with the patient and family involved, but there's a desire to change the telephone handoff with a transporter, that's in quotes, pushing the patient to the floor. That, that's actually a great question and was, was, was and is one of our biggest uh, challenges. Um, as, as everybody, um, I'm sure, in the webinar is, is very, well, very well aware of, that a nurse leaving the unit is a, a, challenge, it's a challenge for the ED because of other patients coming in. It's a challenge for the med surge unit uh, because of assignments. And what we did in developing this process is um, I had the entire leadership from clinical coordinators, managers, and directors from med surge and the ED together. We went through a very detailed Lean Six Sigma DMAIC process. We kept the focus on zero harm and we had to culturally work through how we would do that. And what we ended up with is a shared approach. Um, we now have sometimes where the med surge nurse will come to the ED and get the patient. Sometimes the ED nurse will um, go upstairs. But what we've done is eliminated the majority of time required for that face-to-face. -face. The face-to-face -face is really an acknowledgement of the patient in the new location and a warm handover with the person in the bed seeing that clear communication between the two nurses. The majority of the information, the checklist information, is actually built into our electronic health record, our, our, our EMR, and as our process goes through its system, once the bed assignment is made, that trigger goes to the med surge nurse, that med surge nurse then looks up the EHR, reviews the information, if they have any questions for clarity, they will contact the ED nurse. They will have that clinical clarification via phone. And then again, the face-to-face -face handover is a warm, person-centered approach. Great, thank you so much. Um, this kind of leads into another question, which I think you may have already partially answered, but it's from Mitchell Goldstein and he asks, could you comment on EHR integration of handoff communication? I think both Dr. Barker and I can do that. As we, and I'll start with, we all have different EHRs, whether it is Cerner, Epic, Meditech, whatever it is. I, I would beg that we need not get hung up in um, the, the, the integration, but instead, how do we use clinical information that's already collected and already existing within the EMR and pull it to a common place so that in the review of the checklist, in review of the of preparation for handover, the sender and the receiver have a single source to look at. And that's, we're working on that. We, we've got a pretty good process right now. Um, it can be refined a little bit. And when you have that pool of information, it does not require double entry. It does not require rework. Um, but again, the, the checklist and the process of the, of the handover is the foundation of how we begin sorting and pulling that data to a single location. Yeah, thanks. I'd uh, like to add to that. First of all, hi, Mitch. I'm glad you could join us. Um, the, that one slide I showed, which was basically a picture of my iPad, um, I, I didn't spend a lot of time on that, but the idea was that, yeah, this would be something that was wirelessly connected to the EM, EMR, and the pertinent results uh, for this particular handoff would, would automatically show up, and any results that either the sender or the receiver wanted that were not automatically showing up, they could demand uh, ultimately, verbally, hey Alexa, show me the MRI results. You know that that sort of thing. I, I think the sky is the limit on this now that we have integrated EMRs. And I, uh, you know, I have my my share of objections to EMRs, but the end result is going to be great because for the first time, it ties all the different parts of the medical record together uh, in into one file, and you don't have to go 
to radiology and then back to pathology and then, you know, back to the clinical lab, and it's all tied together. So it should all be accessible during the handoff. One other short comment <clears throat> I wanted to make. I'm, a, I'm an anesthesiologist, so obviously my world is the operating room. I'm used to, totally accustomed to handoffs being face-to-face -face in person. I got to admit, I have problems with handoffs by telephone, and I, I realize that in the real world, uh, that's going to be at least partially necessary sometimes, unavoidable uh, probably. But boy, there's so many advantages to face-to-face, -to -face, and maybe we can learn from that and even make the, the telephone handoffs more like face to face by having do you know do them on something like Skype where you're actually looking at each other and, and facial expressions are worth a lot. So I, I just wanted to put in a plug for that. Thanks. Great. And I just wanted to add, this is Ariana from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. So uh, we have a monthly e-newsletter that comes out uh, at, at the beginning of each month. So you can look forward to on July 2nd, um, if you subscribe to that, seeing a spotlight on handoff communications from um, UCI and Parish Medical Center. Um, UCI talks about incorporating their handoffs in their EHR, so watch for that. And if you haven't um, subscribed, head to our website and uh, join our, it's called Follow Our Progress, and you'll join our mailing list and you'll get that um, uh, resource. Okay, we have lots of questions here on the chat room, so before we open and unmute, I'm going to continue going through some of these questions. We still have a lot of time. Um, so, how, one uh, question from Robin Fastman says, how do you ensure the checklist is actually used as intended and that staff aren't just signing off? Uh, that, that's, in, that's in the culture, the great question again. Um, from my perspective, that is in the culture of the organization. Um, we, the, the organization and the individuals have to be committed to outcomes of zero harm. And if we're going to be committed to outcomes of zero harm, we have to use the performance improvement tools that are evidence-based and, and drive that process. Healthcare is finally learning um, after many, many years that when we are person um, centered, when we are person dependent, we make errors. Just like Dr. Barker you know, shared in, in some of the historical information, whether it be in the area industry or whatever else is, when the person is there, we can make a mistake. When we use those evidence-based systems such as checklists, that's when we can approach and achieve uh, zero harm. Also, the, the existence of the checklist and the flow chart, flow processes need to be a natural part of the EMR, a natural part of the visual of that planning for and actual transitions in care. So we have it both in the EMR, we've got it hard copy, um, and we review it on a regular basis as part of an expectation. Yeah, uh, I agree with everything you said, and then I would just add, um, you know, that's a, that's a tough question to answer. Aviation obviously learned it the hard way, and they are religious about it now. They do not ignore their checklists. We, uh, we would obviously want to use both a carrot and stick approach. I like carrots a lot better than sticks. <laughs> the carrot is that it's going to be best for the patient, and you know that. Uh, the stick, frankly, is, uh, I, I hate to sound like Big Brother, but, you know, we can listen to handoffs and monitor them and audit them. Uh, it's like all these procedures that are being used to audit compliance with hand washing in the operating room. Um, to, to coin George Orwell, Big Brother is watching you. Um, I, like I said, I like the carrots a lot better than the sticks, but yes, we, we do have to make sure that, that people do uh, basically comply with uh, what we're doing. And if they don't think they should, we want to hear reasons. Great. We have a question from Kathleen O'Neill, and I think it's uh, posed directly to Edwin. So it says, how does the pilot hospital, so I'm assuming that's Parish Medical Center, have pre and post data on length of time for handover using this new process? Uh, yes, and as, as I stated earlier, we've seen a 30% reduction uh, in that time frame. So uh, 
industry best standard for uh, clean, bed assign, clean bed assigned to patient in the bed, best practices at 30 minutes. Um, we were not even near that world. Um, we were greater than 60 minutes for that time frame, uh, more in the 65 to 67 range. And almost immediately upon implementation of this process and the checklist, we dropped that down to 40 minutes um, and are working on that time frame now. So we've seen significant improvement in efficiencies. Great. And she also asked, did you have a change in sentinel events with implementing a new process with respect to handover communication? I, I think the, the, the the answer is the potential is there. As I reported, we had 48, and, I, and again, I use a very broad term of potential harm. We had 48 events in the calendar year of 2017. Since this implementation, we have had zero events to date, knock on wood. Um, and, and because of that, we will have you know, the, the ability to intensely prevent those harm events from happening. Just, uh, yeah, what you're talking about is outcome studies. That's always the uh, holy grail. Is there a study that shows that your change has affected, has improved outcome? Those studies are coming, and uh, as, as Edwin said, I, you know, we're going to see the results. I think the, the things I've read in the Joint Commission newsletters uh, make it clear that, that the outcome of this will be positive. But we can't wait for outcome studies to, to be uh, implementing this. I'll, I'll just remind everybody, there are still no outcome studies showing that the use of pulse oximetry in the operating room improves mortality. And yet we wouldn't dream of doing surgery without a pulse oximeter. Great. Um, so we, we still have plenty of questions coming in, so we're not going to unmute just uh, quite yet. So keep the questions coming in the chat room. Um, we have a question from Christina uh, Hayes Camp. She asks, "How would you suggest that a hospital or unit of providers implement, measure, and sustain use of a handoff process in order to truly change the culture of handoff communication?" <laughs> um, I'll start, and Dr. Barker, please. Uh, for me, from my perspective, it starts with a organization's commitment to a culture of safety. Uh, the commitment to a culture of safety requires uh, very strong, visible um, leadership uh, involvement. It involves a culture that um, listens to the frontline staff members. It involves a culture that honors and respects the input from patients and their families. Um, and it, and it require, a culture of safety requires a commitment to zero. Um, for health care for years, um, there was pretty loud voices that zero was impossible, um, but we, we've, we've proven. I mean, you know, Ariana's first slide where we've saved 81,000 lives this, just this past year, zero is possible. Um, and when we believe that and we put this, and, and here's my, my soapbox for a minute, when we put the science and methodology of performance improvement um, and we use Lean Six Sigma into the process, that's when a unit in an organization can intentionally implement handoff checklists and processes that achieve zero. Yeah, just I'll just add that you know this culture of safety issue. It's it is also one of the key emphasis uh, areas of the patient safety movement, establishing the culture of safety, and. Um, I encourage all of you who haven't had a chance to yet to visit our website and look at all uh, 16 of our uh, actionable patient safety solutions attacking these different problems, uh, one of which is handoff communications. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's culture of safety, right? Perfect. We have another question from Lindsay Schwantz. She asks, what are some other measures of success or metrics utilized? Incidents uh, reported on handoffs or patient satisfaction? Um, actually, I am tracking the, those items. I am looking for uh, HCAPS data, which that obviously is lagging. Um, I have seen, and I, and I don't want to give numbers yet, um, in our vendor, I am seeing some early indicators of improvements in improved communications and improved transitions of care. 
Um, we are looking at um, also indicators related to um, staff satisfaction and staff uh, trust in each other. As I described, we, we've taken several months in building the team between the ED and med surge, and we've seen walls come down, um, virtual walls come down between those two, te two teams, and I, and I hope to see that as a measure measurable component in our next NDNQI um, RN satisfaction survey. Great. That, uh, just real quick, that reminds me that another feature we've discussed of these handoffs that hadn't occurred to me is that in quite a few of them, not all, but in quite a few of them, the patient and or the family members can and should be participants. You can learn things from the patient that you can't learn from the doctor. Mm -hmm. Great. We have another question from Christina Hayescamp. She says, in aviation, are takeoff checklists universal? Should there be a universal handoff communication method in medicine to ensure maximum benefit? Well, I, I can start with the first answer because the short answer is basically yes. Nobody in their right mind would take off in any airplane from a Piper Cub to a 777. Uh, without going through a pre-takeoff checklist because when you push that throttle forward and pull that stick back, it's, it's your life that's on the line, uh, which is one place where, uh, yeah, the aviation analogy sort of breaks down a little bit. Um, but, yeah, the answer is yes. So why shouldn't it be universal in, in uh, medical care and specifically in handoffs? I, I, I completely agree. And, the, and there is evidence-based practices such as SBAR, which provides us that starting point for universal um, process for developing and utilizing checklists and handoffs. Great. Perfect. Um, let's unmute for now. Let's see if anyone else perhaps um, wants to Yes, actually, we used IPASS um, and the research within the IPASS in developing our checklist, and we made an intentional choice to use SBAR as the format, but there are elements of IPASS within the both um, flow chart and um, content that we used. I, so that I think use, making sure that we use all relevant um, evidence-based um, information is critical. Great. Well, with two minutes to spare, um, I am going to uh, close us out. I think we now just have one minute. Yep. I want to remind everyone that the actionable patient safety solutions, all of them, including the handoff communication ones, can be found on the Patient Safety Movement Foundation's website, and they're free to access. So please download, please give us feedback, um, please implement them and give us feedback on how they're making a difference in your hospital setting. 
Um, I'm also going to just do a quick shout out on uh, Save the Dates for upcoming events through the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. So as I mentioned, our next patient safety uh, newsletter, which is virtual, our July issue is focused on handoff communications and does highlight successes from UC Irvine Health and Parish Medical Center. It will be released on Monday, January, excuse me, January, July 2nd. Our next quarterly webinar will be related to central line associated bloodstream infections. Uh, we'll be announcing some speakers soon, but it's uh, several, it'll be two speakers hopefully that will be speaking about how they've seen zero harm and zero deaths in uh, several units within their hospital. Our mid-year planning meeting is coming up on September 17th here at UC Irvine Health. Um, you can request your invitation today. There still are some spots open, so we hope that you'll be able to join us there. And then our seventh annual World Patient Safety Science and Technology Summit will be held January 18th and 19th at the Hyatt Regency Huntington Beach Resort and Spa, and registration opens soon. So we thank you so much for your time, and uh, we will talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, all. Thank you. Thanks, Edwin. Thanks, Edwin. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Wow.